I'm going to welcome uh, Dr. John Varga from the Northwestern Scleroderma Program to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Um, and then we're going to break, uh, so this will be our last presentation for the morning. We're going to break at noon um, and have a, uh, we've got some box lunches um, and that should be plenty of time for, uh, to take a lunch break. So we'll go from about 11.15 to noon for this next presentation. So welcome Dr. Varga. Thank you, and we apologize for the uh, slide problems. And is is everybody okay with the audio, or are people having trouble hearing? Yeah, it's okay. All right. Uh, so every year at this fall educational event, we uh, honor a, a distinguished speaker with a Walter Barr lecture. Uh, Dr. Walter Barr was a member of the medical staff at Northwestern. He was a colleague and friend, and he was a physician who became interested in scleroderma very early on at a stage where we really knew very little about this disease. He became very interested in studying it, in organizing clinical trials, and really promoting research into understanding the disease. Um, and so he's really played an important role in both uh, two, three decades ago in starting to advance the research in scleroderm and also in inspiring other younger physicians to go in and focus on studying scleroderma. So this lecture that we have every year really honors uh, an individual who really makes major contributions uh, in this field. And I can think of really no better speaker for the Walter Barr lecture uh, than today's speaker, Dr. Murray Barron. Uh, Dr. Barron is a professor of medicine at McGill University in beautiful Montreal, Canada, where it's probably already snowing. I imagine it will snow for many months to come. Uh, he's been chief of rheumatology there for a long time, and he's really become a leader in scleroderma. One of the remarkable things Dr. Barron did is a number of years ago, he organized a nationwide uh, consortium of all the scleroderma programs in Canada. And he really did this through his force of personality and enthusiasm, where to the point where this Canadian scleroderma research group that you see up there is centered throughout the country that really work beautifully together, share patients, share data, share information. And together they are really making a major contribution to better understanding the disease and developing better treatments. And as a mark of how productive this group is, they publish over 150 scientific publications in remarkable productivity and shows you how with good leadership and good uh, teamwork, you can really uh, achieve amazing things. Um, uh, Dr. Barron is very highly respected and regarded as a scientist, as a clinician, as an educator. Uh, last year, I was honored to participate in a big event up at McGill that was in honor of his contributions to his university and his hospital. So we're really delighted and honored to have uh, Dr. Barron here who will talk about his experience with clinical trials and some of the challenges and opportunities in scleroderma. Murray. Thank you very much for a very, very kind uh, introduction. It's all lies, but it's okay. Dr. Vargas is a good guy. He's, I like him. I think, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this beautiful city. I love Chicago. The buildings, everything is fantastic. And what I really like about it this particular weekend is that it's way colder here right now than it is in Montreal. So it's good to go somewhere where it's worse than it is at home. That doesn't happen to me too often. You know? um, I, I lie too. I'm really not going to talk too much about clinical trials in scleroderma. I'm going to talk a little bit about scleroderma, but I thought that because there are a lot of trials going on and you hear them in the news and you know about them and your doctors talk about them, I thought I would talk about clinical trials in general. This is like clinical trials 101. Have you taken that course in school ever? No. Okay. okay. So we're going to talk about that. And to help me out, and this is probably the most important part of it all. I've asked uh, Kathleen Aaron, who is one of the managers of clinical research at Northwestern, working with Dr. Varga, to uh, uh, 
be the, uh, what's the word, the uh, cleanup hitter, you know? At the end of the talk, she's going to sort of talk about what the patient experience has been like. And I know that a lot of patients have a lot of questions to ask about what it's like to be in clinical trials. And to tell you the truth, doctors don't know anything about that. The people that really know that are the research assistants who work with the patients every day in the clinical trial. And they know the most. I have a feeling that you may want to ask Kathleen a lot of questions at the end that I probably couldn't answer. Um, okay, headlines. The headlines this year, FDA okays first treatment for a rare lung disease. It approved an intended of the drug that we just heard talk about, an excellent talk by our resident respirologist about slowing pulmonary function decline in scleroderma. Um, so the first drug approved specifically for scleroderma as far as I know. I don't think there's another drug. So in all these drugs that we've talked about, you know, you take proton pump inhibitors for your stomach, they're not approved for scleroderma. They just happen to be on the market or approved for other reasons. And luckily, a, any doctor can write a prescription to anybody for one of these drugs and it gets covered. But when it comes down to $50,000 a year drugs, you can just imagine that your insurers are going to be a little hesitant about letting us just write prescriptions, right? And there's going to be rules about who gets what, when, for how long, etc., right? So this was the breakthrough, but is this the first treatment for scleroderma? Well, no, I mean, we already use a lot of off-label drugs um, to treat you. You heard about the drug mycophenolate, which is the in drug now for treating scleroderma lung disease. It, it isn't an approved drug for scleroderma lung disease. There was a study that showed that maybe it worked. Um, so we're all using it because we're grasping at straws and we'll use whatever we can. But it's not an approved drug specifically for scleroderma, right? There's a lot of other treatments out there that uh, are drugs approved for other things, so they got released on the market that you might hear about and doctors may offer them to you, such as rituximab or rituximab, a Tamra drug that I'm going to talk about a little bit, cyclophosphamide, if those of you have had bad lung disease, maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine years ago, perhaps got cyclophosphamide for that rather than mycophenolate or cell cell, right? So, what, how are drugs, uh, what are they aimed at in order to affect this disease? There's basically two things going on. First of all, it's an autoimmune disease. There's something wrong with the body's immune system that leads it to attack itself, and that causes inflammation, right? So inflammation is one of the things that drugs are aimed at here. So what's inflammation? This is inflammation. You know, you have a little infection at the tip of your finger, and it gets red, it gets swollen. That's inflammation. You get a sore throat, you look in the mirror, and your throat's all red, and there's pus in there, and it looks awful. That's inflammation, right? So what is that? Well, inflammation is all red and swollen, because you have a lot of new blood vessels that are coming into the area, they're dilated, they make it look red, the blood vessels are leaky, so the stuff that comes out of the blood vessels into the tissues around it. You've got your white blood cells called neutrophils inside the blood vessels that slip out and go into the tissues and they're, they're there to get rid of the bugs that are in your tissue, right? Um, so here's someone who's had a cut of the skin and there's a lot of bacteria that come into the cut and your body's inflammation system, your immune system, tries to control that infection with those bacteria, right? And it gets red, it gets swollen, the blood vessels are leaky, etc. So that's one part of scleroderma. It's an autoimmune disease, the body's immune system's involved. We think that maybe if we can stop something going on in the immune system, we can stop the, the disease. The other part of the disease is what you see. You don't see much inflammation, really, when you look at a patient with scleroderma. You see scar tissue, thickened skin, uh, scar tissue in the esophagus that we've heard about today, scar tissue in the lungs that we've heard about today, right? So, scar tissue is when you have a cut and it heals, after that cut that I showed you before, you get inflammation at the beginning, but then it heals and you see a scar, right? What's the scar? So, you have a, a big cut in the middle here and uh, it fills in with a blood clot and extra collagen fibers form across the bottom, eventually they'll form up to the top. So extra collagen, which is what makes skin thick in scleroderma, is really scar tissue, actually. So it's a disease where there's an excess of scarring in the body. And the main cell, called the fibroblast, that produces these collagen molecules, is overactive in scleroderma, 
and it's produ producing all this excess collagen, which is ex excess scar tissue, right? So if we can, if we hypothesize that the scarring comes because there's too much inflammation. So either you can affect the inflammation, block that pathway to that excess scarring, or maybe you can do something to this cell directly and forget about the inflammation, let it go on, but stop the scarring from occurring, which is really what causes the clinical manifestations of the disease, right? So drugs are generally in those two categories in scleroderma. Either you knock out something in the inflammation pathway or you knock out something in the scar tissue pathway. And this is a nice picture, if I were to show it to you, of what these fibroblasts look like when they're producing collagen, all the little stuff coming out from them, okay? And this is a punch biopsy of someone's forearm in scleroderma. So someone's shaking their head, someone did it to you, right? Was it you still have the scars. I hope it wasn't Dr. Varga. No, it was Dr. Varga. Okay. You can be a bad guy sometimes. So I do that too. So you take a little cylinder of skin out, take it out, and if you were to cut that cylinder and look at it, what you see is this is the top of your skin, uh, the epidermis, and this is all called the dermis under the top. And this is basically what happens is that first of all, there is some inflammation. These little purple dots here. You see them? Yeah. These little purple dots are inflammation type of cells, white blood cells. But there's a lot of excess collagen here. And in fact, this cylinder that you take out from the skin of someone with scleroderma is a bigger cylinder than if you took it out from a normal person, right? And it weighs more because the collagen is denser and it's actually a longer cylinder. You produce a lot of excess collagen. All right. So how do you treat this? As I said, either you interfere with the immune system or you interfere with the production of collagen. One of those two. All right. So, how do you know if this drug you've got, you hypothesize is going to work, and it's going to work? How do you know if that drug is working? You know, what does it mean to see? What does it mean to see if a drug works, right? How do we do that? So, how are studies done? So, the FDA, which regulates drug trials and what what has to be done to show that a drug that works and should be approved like it was for an intended for the lungs, right? These trials are called randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, parallel group studies, performed in many countries, right? So what do all these things mean? And why, does it, why is this being done? First of all, what does it mean to be in a randomized trial? Who is in trial here? Two, three, just three? Okay. So, if you were in one of these big trials, you were randomized, right? That means that you were given a drug by chance, either the drug sort or the placebo arm. You, you didn't have the doctor say, I think I'm going to give you the real drug because I like it, or I don't really like it too much, and you're not so sick, I'm going to give you the placebo. You know, you can't do that. It's not the way to do a study. It has to be, you have to be randomized to one or the other and you don't know which one you're randomized to. You don't know if you're randomized to the real drug or the placebo. You don't know, and the doctor doesn't know. So you're blind, and the doctor's blind. So that's what it means to be double blind. That's what the double blind study is. You're both blinded. That's because you can't cheat. If you don't know it's what drug a patient is on, or what's he's on, the drug or the placebo, then you can't say, he's gotten better because I really believe this drug should be working. If you knew the guy's on placebo, the woman's was on placebo, nah, she didn't get so much better, better. You know, you can't know that because we're all biased. Um, you know, if you know you're on the real drug, uh, you could have said, well, you're hoping you're going to be better, so you're going to answer questions. I'm a little leaning toward the big and better part, you know? If you know you're on a sugar pill, you don't really believe in sugar pills, nah, I'm nah, not so much better, right, you know? So that's why studies have to be double-blind. You must be, it must be done rigorously, no cheating allowed, right? Placebo control, why do you have to have a placebo? My God, you've got to go through this one-year study, you might be getting a sugar pill, right? Because we know that if you do an open trial of a drug and you look to see who gets, how many people get better during the year, there's always a lot of people that get better on drugs that don't work. You know, a few years ago, everybody with terminal cancer in the United States was taking apricots, apricot seeds. There's a drug called Laetrile. 
It was a whole big thing about how, why, why aren't we approving this fantastic drug? Because everyone told stories of how they got the cancer just melted and went away when they took Laetrile. There was so much pressure on them that the uh, National Institutes of Health actually carried out a placebo-controlled, randomized, double-blind trial on Laetrile. Not because they thought it would work, but because there was a lot of public pressure. And lo and behold, it did nothing. There was no difference between the group on the drug and the group not on the drug. But you know, when you have a terminal disease, it's not hard to understand how you might say you feel better when you're taking something that you have a lot of hope in, right? So those are called anecdotes. Anecdotes are nice. They may lead to con conducting a trial, but they aren't science. You have to have hard evidence if you're going to pay $50,000 a year for a drug, right? Uh, especially if it's coming out of your pockets. Big trials, these are called phase three trials, which is the trial that approves a drug, has to be done almost always in multiple countries. Why? Because really, you're going to get the drug around the world. There's different racial groups. Maybe there are different genetics of these different racial groups. Maybe their diets are different. Maybe there's something in the air that's different. And maybe that has some effect on how drugs work. Who knows, right? So you have to really show that this drug is going to work in all the places where the drug is going to be used eventually, right? So these have to be big trials. So in scleroderma trials in adults, first of all, trials are almost never done in children and adults at the same time because the diseases are somewhat different, right? So you have to be 18 years of age or older and looking around this room, I don't see anybody under 18, uh, but children do get scleroderma. Trials almost always done in scleroderma define the patients that are entering, entering that trial with very strict inclusion criteria. For example, most trials will only take patients in with a certain disease duration. They won't allow people in uh, who've had disease for 20 years. It's very, very rare for trials to allow that. And most of the trials done now are taking in patients only with recent onset disease. And in fact, how you even define disease duration is important. And in most studies, it's defined as the time at which you develop the first non Raynaud's evidence of having disease. So you may have had Raynaud's phenomenon for 10 years. You all have Raynaud's phenomenon, right? Almost everybody. Um, but you may have had it for 10 years before the other part of the disease developed, or you may have had it just one year, right? So really, it's often defined as from the first symptom, which is often, for example, puffy hands or shortness of breath, uh, after the Raynaud's phenomenon, right? Secondly, it'll start from, I mean, it'll have to be within the first year and a half in some trials, some trials within the first three years, some trials the first five, the first seven, and the recent trials have almost never gone beyond seven years, right? So that's very important. What does that mean to you if you've had disease for 10 years and you go and ask to be put on the specific drug? The truth is that drug was not tested in somebody with 10 years of disease. So maybe you're not a candidate. In fact, what's going to happen when a drug gets approved, it will be used outside of the study protocol uh, uh, inclusion criteria. But you have to understand that the study was of patients, for example, with only disease up to five years. You've had disease six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. This drug may not work in you. You may be very different from the patients who were in the trial. Right? It's very important that you appreciate that when you ask your drug, your, pharma, pharma, your doctor, I mean, for this new medication that's just been approved for scleroderma lung disease, for example. Those were patients who had disease for 20 years. I forget the exact number of years, but it was about seven, I think, in that trial. And there's other uh, disease-related criteria, like I talked about the skin scores. So you may know that, um, that we can do a score to assess your overall skin involvement. We examine a bunch of parts of the body, and each part is described as having a skin score of zero to three, and then we add it all up. And that's your total skin score. Well, some, most trials that are about scleroderma in general that have been using the skin, skin score, and I'll come to that as an outcome, will define what your skin score has to be between to get into the trial. It can't be too low and it can't be too high. Well, if your skin score doesn't fit within that, uh, that, that, that uh, range, 
then you were not a patient that would have gone into that trial for that drug. And that drug may not apply to you, right? So that's a very important thing to understand as well. So the inclusion criteria for trials are very strict and they may not apply, in fact, we know they don't apply to every patient out there with scleroderma that walks into a doctor's office, okay? Can you be on other meds during your trial? That's very important. For example, um, many of you with lung disease are probably already on Celsept or mycophenolate. Well, what if someone offers you a new trial for scleroderma lung disease? And they say, well, you have to stop your mycophenolate, which may have been working for you. And it's a one-year trial, and you're going to get a new investigational drug, or you're going to get a sugar pill. What are you going to do as a patient, right? So there are some trials out that are not using immunosuppressive drugs that will allow you to remain on other immunosuppressive drugs like Celsius. But there are going to be trials of immunosuppressive drugs where you're not going to be allowed to stay on Celsius because it itself is an immunosuppressive drug and you really don't want to over-suppress your body's immune system because it's dangerous, right? So you have to think about that when you're talking about a clinical trial. Can you remain on the drugs that you're already on? And what about, those are inclusions, what about exclusions? Not if it will, even if you meet the inclusion criteria, you still may not be allowed in the trial. You know, for example, if you have bad high blood pressure in your lungs or pulmonary hypertension, a lot of trials will exclude you because you, have, you already have such a big problem and are on so many drugs, you know, it's going to complicate the trial assessment, etc. And you might get very sick from your pulmonary hypertension during the trial, which will bias against it and they don't want that patient in the trial. If you've had a scleroderma kidney uh, crisis, they may not want you in the trial because your kidneys aren't functioning well and that might affect how the drug is metabolized in you, right? If you've had a stem cell transplant, which we heard about this morning, you've already undergone a really radical therapy, probably not going to be accepted into a new clinical trial, right? If your lung disease is too bad, you may not be allowed into a, a trial of lung disease. And that's been a, 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 a criteria in all the lung studies that have been done. And that was a criteria for stem cell transplants as well, and the studies that were done there. You know, if your lungs are too bad, you may get really sick during the trial from your lung disease, you may get infections, you could die during the time of the trial. Nobody who runs a trial wants patients dying in their study. Um, doesn't feel good, doesn't look good, it isn't what we want, but we don't want to make you sicker, right? Okay, so that's important. So if you've got really bad lung disease and you say, well, geez, doctor, you know, I'm really worried. Uh, I need to take this drug. Remember that you weren't in that trial. No one like you was in that trial. So we don't know if the drug is good or bad for you, actually. It could be bad, not just that it you know, may not work. It could be actually bad for you. All right. So remember, when you see t people talking about results, it pays... It, it, it applies to the patients who fit all the inclusion and all the exclusion trial studies uh, requirements, but it may not apply to you. Okay, so when you do a trial, how do you know if the drug works? You can't know about anything unless you can measure it, right? You have to have a way to measure it. Every trial has a primary outcome and many secondary outcomes. Whatever the outcome is, it's something that you have to measure. So how do you know if a patient with scleroderma is better? What are you going to do? You're just going to say, you feel better? No, maybe. Maybe. Maybe that's not a bad endpoint. That isn't the endpoint that has been used. The FDA wants to know, they really do want to know, do you feel better? Do you function better? And are you less likely to die during the time of the trial? Right? That's very important. I mean, death is a hard endpoint. And we don't want people dying of a drug, like the stem cell transplants, which improved mortality over the long term. That was a very important, hard endpoint that was not hard to measure. In scleroderma, it's been difficult to figure out exactly how to measure the disease. And what has been used up to today in most scleroderma trials, when you're asking a question about the global disease, not is your lung better or is your esophagus better, but are you generally better? 
the outcome has been the skin score that I just talked about. Okay? It's not necessarily how you feel, how you function, or are you going to die. It's been the skin score. And there's a lot of discussion right now going on about that because the skin score itself has problems. You know, if, you do, if I do a skin score on you today and I do a skin score on you tomorrow, believe it or not, we're not going to get the same number on both days because I'm not perfect. If I measure you, your height, with a ruler that has only feet and not inches, Canada will be sawing you. But if I, well, I don't, and I have to guess, I have to weigh your five foot, looks like you're five foot three, right? I don't have an inches mark. And I come back the next day with the same ruler, it looks like you're five foot four. I don't remember from yesterday. So the measures we use are always imperfect. There's no perfect measure. Some are better than others, but there's no perfect me measure. When I do the skin score one day to the next, it's never exactly the same. And if I bring in a colleague to measure your skin score the same day I do, it's different because we're, we're not perfect, right? And the changes in the trials may be not huge, and they're affected by this imperfect, but in, imperfect aspect of the skin score. And that may be one of the reasons we don't find a change. Like from one day to the next, the skin score can change by five points. Well, let's say the drug only makes you about five points better. You can imagine how hard it's going to be to find that if the variability in the measure is about five points, right? So that's one problem with the outcomes. The, federal, the FDA only approves a drug if the trial has shown its primary outcome to be positive. There's a whole bunch of secondary outcomes. Let's say we're doing um, a trial, we pick the skin score as the primary outcome, and I'll show you a trial. But it turns out that maybe the lungs got a little better from this drug, but the skin didn't, right? That drug will not be approved. Because the secondary outcomes are not perfect. There are problems with secondary outcomes that has to do with statistical problems, right? It may be that if you use that same drug to treat that secondary outcome, and you designed your trial just for that, that you may not find what you did in that first trial. It may have been by chance, even though it doesn't work like right? right? So be careful when someone says, look, I'm going to use this drug, and, and really it doesn't mean it's bad. We're being bad guys. We use off-label drugs all the time because we want to do the best thing we can without knowing everything, right? But it doesn't mean that for sure that drug is going to work for you because it hasn't been studied as a primary outcome for your particular problem that you have, all right? Um, also, side effects are very important to know what happens during a trial to, to, that's not good for you. Every trial looks at side effects. So something may work, but you know, if it worked, but half the people died for some other reason, secondary to the drug, you're not going to give that drug, even though it, it, it does seem to work, right? So toxicity is very important. And you saw something about stem cell transplants. Patients died early on from the stem cell transplant, although fewer patients died in the end, right? So the, you have to know that when you go into it, do you want to take that risk of dying from the, from the treatment, even though in the end your chances of living longer are better with that treatment, right? So you have to understand that, okay? The skin score may be something like a surrogate endpoint. So if you have a drug for hypertension, for high blood pressure, who cares if your blood pressure is high or low? You don't really care. What you care about is that you're going to die from high blood pressure, or is blood pressure bad for you, really, right? So kidney disease, stroke, heart attacks, death, those are the reasons to treat high blood pressure. So a lot of, to show that a drug is probably going to reduce those effects, dying from high blood pressure, we have accepted the blood pressure itself as a surrogate outcome. You know, the trial just has to show that the drug works for high blood pressure, and the assumption has become that, well, if it lowers your blood pressure, you probably are going to die less from hypertension than if you didn't take this drug, right? So the skin score doesn't mean that everything, if that gets better, does it mean that other parts of the disease are going to get better? Is your mortality going to be less? Are your lungs going to be better? Are you less likely to, to, to feel bad? Are you more likely to function better? So we're just starting to look at that, and we've just done some work on that, actually, and shown in fact, if you look at patients over a period of a year or two, 
those whose skin improves on its own without being in the drug trial tend to have less worsening of their lung disease. They certainly feel better um, because skin has a lot to do with how you feel and how you function, right? Um, and in fact, mortality may even be less in those who get better. So maybe it is a surrogate for the global disease, right? So why can't we have many primary outcomes in a trial? And you're, you're, you're not allowed to have a primary and why that is. Um, it, it turns out that if you look at many outcomes at one time, the chances of finding something positive, just by chance, become higher, right? You know, when you're, you go to your doctor and he does this, uh, I forget what they're called here, Ken 12, whatever it's called, right? He, they take one vial of blood and they do 12 or 24 blood tests on that, right? You never look at a patient's results and see all 24 tests are normal. It never happens. And the reason is, what does normal mean? Normal means within 95% of people will have that. But the 5% of people who are normal have values outside that range, right? The more tests you do, the more likely, just by chance, you're going to find something that's outside the range. And it doesn't mean you're sick. The same thing in a trial. If you look at many outcomes, the more likely you're going to find something that looks like, wow, oh, the drug worked for that, right? But in fact, it's just chance. It doesn't mean the drug really works. So you have to limit your number of outcomes, and usually there's only one primary outcome. All right. Secondary outcomes are used really to support the primary outcome and to look at additional effects, um, and they are important. It's important to know about them, but they won't get drugs approved, all right? Really, they're really only interpreted if, there's, if you first show that the primary endpoint in a trial is being met, okay? How many patients do you have to put into a trial? Why do we have, you look, look at the cardiac trials, you know, they've got 10,000 patients. And, and the reason is that they're trying to prevent death, basically, those trials, and deaths don't occur that often. So they need huge numbers of patients, right? Um, so that's called the sample size in the trial. Most of the scleroderma studies, the global sample sizes, are somewhere between 100 and 300 patients, and they're done all over the place, and half are maybe getting the drug, and half are maybe getting the placebo. Sometimes more get the drug than get the placebo ratio-wise, so there's different ways to do the studies, okay? Um, sometimes we put multiple aspects of the disease, cheat it away, into one primary outcome measure. And I'll give you an example of that. So first of all, this is how the skin score is done. We look at all these parts of the body, we score everybody, every part zero to three, we add them all up, boom, you got a skin score. And I've shown you that that's not always perfect. Okay? So this is a, a composite outcome, and it's the only one really that has started to be used in scleroderma clinical trials. It's got a long name, the American College of Rheumatology Provisional Composite Response Index for Clinical Trials of Early Diffuse Cutaneous Scleroderma, short, it's called the CRISP. So it's only for people with early disease, not 10 years of disease, it was designed that way, and it's only for people with diffuse cutaneous disease, it means we divide patients up into limited cutaneous or diffuse, and diffuse means from the elbows up, the trunk, the abdomen, and from the knees up, okay? If your disease is just from the elbows down to the fingers, from the knees down to the toes, and your face, that's limited. So that, this index has not yet been confirmed to be good to be used in that disease. And what is this index? So when we look at an index such as the skin score, we take the mean skin score of all the patients who are on drug, and the mean skin score of all the patients who are on placebo, and we look at the mean change in the two groups, and we compare the means. So the skin score went up by an average, uh, went down, sorry, by an average of, let's say, six in the placebo group, and went down by an average of 16 in the scleroderma. In the drug group, well, it looks like maybe the drug has helped, right? So the other way to look at an outcome is a, I was called a binary outcome. It's yes or no, improved or not improved. And that's how this Chris was designed, although it's been used in other ways, it was really designed, is the patient better after one year or not? 
and are therefore are more patients who take the real drug in a trial better than the number of patients who improve in the placebo. Because we know that they're going to get improvement in both groups. Whatever you do, placebo patient is always improvement. Remember that, right? Every trial we do, patients who don't get the real drug do improve, all right? Are there more in one group than the other? And the way this was done was, first of all, there were obvious reasons to think you haven't improved. If you die during the year, you for sure have not improved. Your chances of improving your score is a zero, right? If you get new bad heart disease, if you get new scleroderma renal crisis, if you get really terrible progression of your lung disease, that's it. You count as not improved, right? If any of those terrible things have not happened to you during the trial, then we look at a whole bunch of other stuff that we now put together. So MRSS is the skin score, and we mod it's called the modified Rodman skin score. We look at how much change there has been in the year, and you, right, within each group. FEC is a measure of your lung function. How much change was there in your lung function? We ask you, how do you feel today? How do you feel in the last week or the last month? And we give you, there's a number, right? And we, and we see how much that's changed over the year. We ask your doctor the same exact question. Do you think this patient, how do you think they're doing today? Are they good, not so good, terrible? Markov, give me a number, and we measure that over the year. How much change has there been? And we use those five things, and we put them into a computer. as a big black box, and it comes out with a number, a score. And it turns out that if your score is greater than, scores are zero to one, if your score is greater than 0.6, the chances are that you improved. And if the score is less than 0.6, the chances are you have not improved, right? So this is a whole new concept. Rather than looking at the average of a certain number, what are the chances that you actually improved in the study that we're going to later? So it's a new endpoint, all right? The next thing to know about studies is how do you know that the difference in the amount of improvement in the drug group is really different from the amount of improvement in the placebo group? Because I showed you, like, you may use a drug and the skin score average may have gotten six points better in the placebo and maybe 16 points in the drug. Well, is that real or is, it that, is that just by chance? What if it was 10 in the drug and six in the placebo? Is it as obvious that the drug really was important? What if it was seven and six? What do you think? Does that drug really work? Who would say yes? No, because we know that small changes happen, and where small becomes big is not e is a statistical mathematical concept, right? And what we want to know is that there's only a five five percent. Remember that number. There's only a five percent chance that the difference we found between the two groups is by chance, right? So there's a 95% chance that it's true, it's a true difference in the two groups. You can imagine that the seven and the six, probably there's a way bigger chance that probably it's 80% chance that it's not different, right? Maybe only a 20% chance that it really is a difference, right? So that 5% number is what's used in a trial, in all trials, basically that you want to know that there's only, a, and it's never 100%. You never know that it's 100%. You know that there's only a 5% chance that we made a mistake and really those two groups are the same. Right? If, it's, if it's less than 5%, then we accept it, and that drug will get approved. All right? I gave you an example here, but I'm going to go through that. We don't have enough time. Okay. So let's look at one study. This is the study of a drug called Tocilizumab, or Actenra. This is a drug which is out there on the market. It's used for rheumatoid arthritis and some other things. And it is an anti-immune system drug. It blocks the immune system in one particular way and it's aimed at one particular molecule amongst the millions that are involved. And it works in rheumatoid arthritis, right? So we know that scleroderma has some immune features to it. So this was studied in a large multi randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study across many countries. So this is the ultimate phase three trial, all right? And you have to be 18 years or older. You have to have your disease for less than five years. So remember that. 
If you've had it for 20 years, you ask for this drug, it might work, might not. It might kill you. Who knows, right? You don't know. I don't know. You have to have a skin score between 15 and 40 to get into the study. What if your score is 45? What if it's 7? Is the drug for you? And you have to have what they call active disease, and there's a whole bunch of ways they look at that, okay? And, you know, who knows who's going to fit that, right? So patients were randomly assigned. They didn't know, the doctors didn't know. They got the drug, it's given by injection once a week, or they got a placebo injection once a week for almost a year, 48 weeks. And the primary difference was the difference in the skin score. And one of the key secondary outcomes that they had planned to look at was your lung function as measured by this test called FVC. Right? And they had 210 patients that they looked at, and they had quite short duration of disease, only 23 months, and their skin score was right in the middle of that, that range that I showed you, about 20. And it turns out that the, the FVC number was 82%. So FVCs above 80 are normal. All right? From 80 to 120 is kind of the normal range of FVC, really. So the mean was above normal, which you remember that, which means that half the patients had normal lung function and about half did. Okay? And how does that affect the results when you look at the secondary outcome? That's important, right? And they're about half in placebo. And this is the change from baseline in the skin score. So the, the red here is the drug and the yellow-orange is the placebo. And you can see both groups got better. But the difference between this and this is not enough to say with the confidence of only making a mistake 5% of the time. In fact, 9.8, if you said these drugs were different, 9.8% or about 10% of the time, you'd be wrong. 10% is not terrible but it's not what the FDA requires and it's not what we all require when we assess the statistics of a trial. So this trial did not meet the primary endpoint and this drug will not be approved for the use that it was aimed at, which was the skin score, all right? However, interest, very interestingly, sorry, um, this is how much the FEC, the value I showed you, was measured, right? My God, look at this. Uh, in, in placebo, it dropped down to minus about 200, right? And in the drug group, it stayed where it was. So it looks like, the, on average, the lungs in the placebo group got worse, and the lungs in the scleroderma group didn't get any worse, which is not a bad outcome. Right? It's pretty good. So the question is, should we be using this drug to treat patients with scleroderma who have lung problems? Tell you the truth, I, I don't really know. Would I do it? Probably, because I'm not perfect, and I probably would cheat, as we all would in medicine. I reckon we, would look, right? we, know, we know the side effects of the drug well, because it's been used for a lot of other diseases. But honestly, this is, remember, this is a secondary outcome Half the patients didn't even have bad lung disease to start with because their, their numbers were normal to start, right? So do we really know who to give the drug to? No. So the next question for the company that makes this drug is should we do a trial where we make that the end primary endpoint? And I, I don't know exactly where that's at now, but I know the company's talking about it. Whether they're going to do it or not, I don't know. Okay? If you're going to do a trial, you're going to select patients differently for lung disease outcome than you would for a skin score outcome. So you may not be the right person to treat, and maybe your lung disease wasn't really the kind that was in the trial. All right? Side effects happen a bit more of the drug, especially infections. So all drugs that affect the immune system predispose you to infections, and they can be serious infections, and you have to know that, but that's a risk of any and one of these drugs. And in fact, let's look at the other way, that drug dentinib that you heard about for the lung disease, a secondary outcome was how much did the skin get better, right? And it turned out that the skin got better in uh, the skin score changed by minus 2.17 in the Nintendo group 
and 1.6.96 in the placebo group. They're different, but is that just by chance? Uh, and it turns out that that doesn't reach that 5% level where you can be confident that the drug really works on skin. Even though it's an, an intended as an anti-fibrosis drug, it's not an anti-immune system drug. And you think that if it works for the lung for fibrosis, maybe it works for the skin for fibrosis, right? But this trial didn't prove that. All right. So a lot of you may be interested in, in, in entering a clinical trial. You want to know what's going on in clinical trials. There's an excellent website run by the National Institutes of Health, I believe, called clinicaltrials.gov. It lists every trial being done everywhere in the world in every disease. And the reason they've instituted this is that a lot of trials were done and they were negative and they never get published. So you never found out what trials failed. Well now, if you've seen it in clinicaltrials.gov and it didn't get published, you know it was done and something went wrong. All right? But if you're looking for trials that are recruiting for patients, you can look it up on clinicaltrials.gov. You can look up scleroderma specifically. You can look up scleroderma lung disease or scleroderma, etc. And you can find the trials that may be applicable to you. You'll find out if they're finished or if they're still recruited or they haven't started yet, all right? So what about the patient experience in the trial? What's it like? And I'm gonna turn the floor over to someone who knows. Can you hear me okay? Um, so I'm Kathleen. I work with um, the Northwestern uh, team, scleroderma team, with Dr. Varga and Dr. Korea. Um, I help manage the clinical trials along with Isaac and, and Mary back there. Um, so most of my experience, pretty much all of my experience with clinical trials has been at Northwestern. So um, these slides are probably pretty specific to Northwestern um, and maybe not you know, at all of the other centers. Things uh, could go a little bit differently, but um, this is just some basics about uh, trials specifically at Northwestern. So um, we have some current and pending scleroderma trials that focus on skin and lung disease and also um, a new one that's coming up that focuses on ray nodes in the hands. Um, so prior to enrollment in trials, patients have to see one of our physicians, so either Dr. Korea or Dr. Varga, um, for an initial visit that's actually prior to screening for the study. Um, that's just a standard of care visit to make sure you know that you, you could possibly be a good candidate for the trial. Um, we usually do most of our study visits in rheumatology clinic or occasionally, depending on the study and, and what the drug, how the drug is administered, we might do um, the visits in the clinical research unit at Northwestern. Um, just some general procedures that most of the studies um, involve. They have blood draws, skin scores, like Dr. Barron had mentioned. Um, we usually do vitals at every visit, uh, physical exams by the physician, um, urinalysis, pulmonary function testing, and um, also the electrocardiograms as well. Um, so what to expect as a trial participant? So um, there's a screening period involved. Um, you come in for a screening visit where we look at your medical history, we take all of your medications down, um, and then we do some different screening tests, lab work, um, lung function testing, just to make sure that you meet the eligibility criteria and that you don't meet any of the exclusion. Um, length of trials typically from six months to a year that you're um, participating. Um, some trials do offer something called an open label extension, um, which is just where after the trial, um, the trial period is done, you have the option to participate in the open label, which means you'd actually be receiving the study drug, you wouldn't be receiving the, the placebo, um, and that usually lasts for about one to two years, but not, not all studies actually offer that. Um, study visits can last from about one to seven hours, uh, depending on the study. Um, you, we will frequently communicate with you if you ever participate in one of our trials. You will probably get to know me pretty well. Um, lots of calls and emailing. Um, often, um, you know, some of the sponsors will request that you don't request your, um, your records um, from the study visits while you're participating in the trial. Um, that's something to note as well. Um, a lot of sponsors reimburse for travel and sometimes hotels depending on uh, what the study involves um, and how far away you live. So uh, just to tip, 
to always uh, keep all of your receipts. Um, stipends are also offered um, for each of the study visits, usually about 50 to 75. Again, that might be Northwestern specific, but um, that's usually what they offer. Um, some sponsors will actually plan travel for you now, so they work with vendors where they'll come in and they'll even have someone pick you up at your doorstep and, and uh, bring, you, bring you to um, the study site. Um, so expectations of patients in trials, so we just ask that you keep close track of symptoms and any medication changes while you're in the study. Um, some patients like to actually keep a little journal, it's not required, but it is very helpful because sponsors want to know exactly when you stopped and started a drug or, or changed a dose. Um, just we ask that you keep us notified of uh, all of your symptoms, any new diagnoses or planned procedures and um, medication changes that includes supplements. Um, and they, some studies actually do ask for a history of medication as well, not just current. Um, you know, it doesn't mean you have to like know the first time you ever took a Tylenol or anything like that, but, but they do ask for some pretty detailed records. Um, if you're taking pills um, for the, tr the trial, um, you have to return your bottles at each visit, um, both empty and partial. Uh, they want all of both of those types back. Um, and then we just ask that you take and uh, store the study drug as you're instructed. So that's pretty much it on my end. Um